All right, would you take out your Bibles and uh, turn with me to uh, Romans 12. We only have one verse tonight. What is wrong with this man? <clears throat> he has good, a little better sense than sometimes. We're looking at, we, we have just come through this marvelous section. Uh, Paul started by telling us to offer our bodies a living sacrifice, put ourselves on the altar and surrender everything. He says, in light of all that Jesus has done for you, that's your only reasonable response. What a, what a, what a true statement that is. And then he tells us, now, you got to think differently. In fact, you got to think with a different mind. You need to start thinking with the mind of the spirit, not the mind of the flesh, if you're going to find your calling, if you're going to find the plan of God for your life. But if you'll listen to that mind and not follow the culture of the world, not listen to your flesh, God will lead you into his perfect, his, his well-pleasing, his, uh, what was the first one? His, his good, which means the path that leads to the most fruit. He'll, he'll show you the path. And then Paul talks about our callings. And he begins to talk about how we're to think about the church. That we're a body, we're a family, we're a team. And that God has created us differently. He's graced us. And he's given us differing calls. What I'm to do and what you are to do is different. But that's the way it's supposed to be. So that we all work together, bringing our different calls together and seeing the whole work of Jesus Christ. That's what he's been teaching on. And that, I mean, that's, that's his point down through verse 8. So he's laid all that out. And then he, it's like he shifts gears uh, just in the most dramatic way. But he really doesn't. This next verse follows quite logically, if you think about it. And he, he goes from showing mercy and, and giving and exhortation and all of this ministry stuff. And then he says in the next verse... Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what's evil, cling to what's good. Why don't you read that out loud with me? Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Let's do it again. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Father, would you open the word to us? Teach us, Lord, to love without hypocrisy, to abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. We don't want to just understand. We want to obey. So open our eyes and show us how to obey and walk in this. We ask in your name. Amen. All right. If you'd look at your discussion guide. I'm sorry. I've got a... We have a car alarm going off in the, in the, in the, in the, in the parking lot. It, it is a gray Land Rover. ALD1236. And we've, it's just going, and we figure your battery will not be there when you're there. We do have a charger, but it'd um, be good if you got that. Thank you. All right, here we go. Don't pretend to love. Having just encouraged us to fulfill God's call on our lives, Paul immediately turns to address the quality of our relationships. Because if we can't work together harmoniously, everything he's just taught us falls apart. Yes, each of us must discover our calling, and yes, we need to pursue the full dimension of God's plan. But if we don't learn how to get along with each other, none of it matters. Love really is the highest quality. In the remaining chapters of this letter, we discover there were numerous areas of controver controversy among the believers in Rome. Differing opinions on matters had hardened, and were separating friends quenching love and inflaming pride. It had become urgent that they rebuild their love for one another because love is the foundation upon which all ministry rests. Do you understand that? It's not just a truism. It's not just poetry. It, it really is the way it works. So in most of these last chapters in, in Romans, Paul are, it's Paul's pastoral counsel to them about how to love. But what may surprise us is he puts at the head of his list what, what he puts there. The first thing he says is, don't pretend to love. Say that, would you? Don't pretend to love. What does Paul say? Paul uses a very common Greek word, which we still use today, hypocrite. 
It was the term the Greeks used for an actor in the theater. This is a very common word. Who used it the most in the New Testament? Jesus did. Jesus did. Uh, he was very, he, and, he, and he, knew, he knew what he was using when he says, don't be like the hypocrites. I have, in my own mind, no, no doubt that he actually probably worked on a theater. There's a, a very elaborate theater three miles from Nazareth in that town, Sepphoris, which is where I think Jesus and his father worked. And uh, who knows whether he worked on that or not, but he was very conversant, and you hear him using theater terms. Uh, he, he knew what he was talking about. He was, I don't think he went to the theater, but I think he may have built one. And uh, so he talks about hypocrites, and that's what the word means. It's an actor in a theater. And remember how profoundly uh, influential the theater was in Greek culture that whole day. Jesus himself used the word a lot uh, to describe people who pretend to love God but really don't. And I just give, look, at, look at all the references. Now we're going through every one. No, we aren't. In this sense, a hypocrite is someone who pretends to be someone else. They pretend emotions they don't feel. They say words they don't believe. They behave in ways that don't represent their heart. And it's the absence of integrity. And we need to also note which Greek word Paul uses for love. There are several options to choose from, and he uses a couple of those in the next few statements. But here, he uses that unique word, agape, that Christians coined to describe the selfless love Jesus modeled for us. I don't know if you're aware of it, but that is not a common Greek word. It was a, an old Greek word, a really old Greek word that had fallen out of disuse by the time of the New Testament. Nobody used the word. But when the Christians were trying to describe the kind of love that you see with Jesus, you saw on the cross, the kind of love that he called you and I to, what are you going to use? Brotherly love? No. Arrows, for heaven's sakes. Uh, storge, family love? What are you going to use? There wasn't any. So they literally took off, uh, took an old word, dusted it off, and began to use it. It's our word. It's our word. Say agape, would you? That's, that's the kind of love Jesus showed us. It's a special sort of love. It's not the word for friendship or romance or even the deep commitment families may have for one another. It's the kind of love that puts others first. It's the new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. Want to guess which word he used? Agape. You bet he did. This pure form of love, we're told, must be genuine. So Paul's words are simply this. Love, agape, without hypocrisy. Don't pretend. Don't fake it. Don't be an actor. Really love like that. Deciding to love. This kind of love is not based on fickle emotion. It begins with a decision to love. And then steadfastly refuses to allow anything to take that love away. We hear God's command. We choose to obey. And then we draw on his power to do the very thing he has asked of us. As his disciple, if he tells me to love, then I will love. And will do whatever is necessary to protect that reality in my heart. Does that make sense? Does this ring a bell in marriage? Can you love like that? Can I choose to love somebody who I at the moment may not like at all? <laughs> no, no, this is not. Um, <laughs> I'm illustrating. As his disciple, if he, I'm going on, if his disciple, he tells me to love, then I will love and will do whatever is necessary to protect that reality in my heart. I can't just will this love into existence, but I can obey the steps I'm told to take and be confident he will put love where it doesn't exist and refresh it when it declines. I got to really hammer this thing for a minute. Excuse me. I don't think we all understand that. 
I think the world is it so influenced us that we think, well, I'm sorry, I just don't love you anymore. Well, then start. Turn it on. Well, I can't do that. Yeah, you can. Yes, you can. You can love anybody you want to love. You've got to get a hold of that. This kind of love starts with a command of God. It's, it's an obedience. You say, well, then it isn't genuine. I, are you expecting me to fake it? Possibly for a while. But what you do is you begin to love indeed. And you choose to, to not allow. It's an attitude. See, when you are, are in angry with somebody, you can start keeping lists. You can start keeping track of all the stuff they do. Trying to really justify your, your, your lo 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 loss of love, your, your hatred. And so you keep a list. Look at he did that, and look at he did that, and he did that, and he did that, and look what he did. Did I tell you, by the way, what he did? And I tell you all this, and I begin to build this in my heart. But if Jesus says, love him, love her. And I say, yeah, then yes, sir, yes, master, I will. I can choose to do it. And I stop list keeping. And I start saying, Holy Spirit, give me love. Show me how to love. If he commands you to do it, you can do it. Say that. If he commands you to do it, you can do it. There you are. Love is not some mysterious thing you can't do. In fact, Jesus' kind of love is always begun with a decision. Who wants to head to the cross? This kind of love always begins in an obedience. I will love, for my master has told me to. Is this too much submission for you? Are you all right with this kind of thing? I mean, like he really is the boss? <laughs> Not just use the words Lord, but actually do what he says. There comes a place in a Christian life where you just say, I'm taking this stuff literally. If my master says love, I'll love. If he says forgive, I'll forgive. If he says don't harbor stuff, I won't harbor stuff. I mean, God give me the grace to do it, but I will obey him. Dangerous honesty. Real love is something that has to be diligently maintained. Human nature is such that our love always tends to cool off. Sooner or later, offense enters every relationship. It's like weeds in a garden. This means you and I have to work hard to preserve love. It is not automatic. Any couple that does not learn this will not stay in love. When we were first married, we actually believed this stuff. And... Uh, our first five years, Mary worked full-time. I went to school full-time and worked 30 hours a week at a church. You can imagine. We saw one another enough to wave as we passed in the parking lot, you know. And those were really hard years. We were going. We were tired. We were stressed. And they weren't easy years in our relationship. And we actually took this thing literally. Okay, I, we got to love. And the master has said, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Okay. So it was a, a, a familiar phenomenon, shall we say, where we would climb into bed and lie there and rustle around to let the other person know that we weren't so carnal, that we had gone to sleep, uh, that we were still awake, uh, waiting for a conversation which we both knew needed to happen. <clears throat> I'm awake. <laughs> Me too. Childish. Rabid. But sooner or later we talked. And over time, those things didn't go malignant on us. They didn't become cancer. They got resolved. They had to be. We were told to, and we, we thought you had to do what you were told. I find that's not always the case. 
There are many things Paul might have said to open this section of his letter, but he chose to say, let agape love be without hypocrisy. In other words, don't pretend, don't fake it, let your true feelings show. He follows this command with another which clarifies his meaning. He adds, if something's evil, openly despise it. If something's good, stand beside it. In other words, don't pretend to be indifferent about things that, you're, that are truly evil. Abhor them. And don't hide your feelings about things that are truly good. Cling to them. Wow. He is inviting us to com be completely honest. At first glance, that sounds like it would have the opposite effect. Instead of strengthening, one would think it would blow apart whatever relationship was left. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you the truth. Everything I feel. Have you ever had somebody say, I've got to tell you what I really think? And you think, okay, here it comes. And you can just hear him going, Ch -ch -ch, you know? <laughs> that is not what we're talking about, nor is what Paul's talking about. Many of us have been taught our entire lives to hide our true feelings. For some, it has become virtually impossible to be honest about our feelings. We're convinced this type of honesty is at least bad taste and often downright dangerous. Candor gives people the opportunity to hurt us. By showing our true feelings, we've given them a bit of knowledge they can use against us. Now we can easily be ridiculed or blackmailed, and the fact that we told the truth makes it all the worse. I'm not asking for any hands raised, I'll tell you. But some of you have come from environments in which the worst thing in the world you could do is let somebody know what the truth was inside because it would immediately be used against you. Either a matter of humor and you would be ridiculed or a matter of blackmail and they had you by the throat. I, I am terribly sorry, but you will have to move beyond that. We need you to move beyond that. And then we need to commit to you to be a safe place and safe people, that when you show us your heart, we will not blackmail you, we will not ridicule you, we will love you. Paul says this whole body thing, this working together, the gifts, the callings, the ministries, he says just throw it out the window if you aren't going to love. That's why he went in instantly to love, and then he's going to hammer it the next chapters. He says, okay, you're saved, you're filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, you're called to ministry. And if you don't love, we have got nothing going. You've got to learn to work together harmoniously and peacefully. Trust. Why are honesty and true love linked together? Why do I have to tell you how I really feel? Why can't I fake it? The answer is simple. We have to be honest if we're going to trust one another. When our relationship is honest, I'm not left wondering what you really think of me or maybe saying about me when I'm not present. I'm able to trust your words. Some people share quite openly, and, and you can joke, you know, TMI, too much, inf too much information, and, and some people let you... But you know... You know the people in your life who, when you're with them, you know exactly how they feel about you. You don't doubt. You don't wonder. You're able to be yourself because there's no hidden agenda. They are what they are. How many have people like that in your life? There are other people, and they may be very polite, but you really don't know what they're thinking. And so you're, you're on your best behavior in a sense. You're, 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 you're wondering if you're making a mistake at any moment or if you've done something or said something you don't like. It's quite stressful. It's exhausting, actually. You, you know, you do your best in those relationships. Well, when you get out of them, it's like, I have been all knotted up trying to perform or please that person, but... What a relief to get out of the present. And yet they're very polite, maybe. Something about honesty. Honesty. 
I know what you think. I know what you feel. Paul says, don't be a hypocrite. Don't be an actor. Don't fake it. Show your heart. If something's evil, hate it. If something's good, cling to the thing. Come on, be who you are. <clears throat> but truth by itself, you know, yes, we need to be true. But truth by itself can inflict the cruelest wound of all. Ridicule or criticism is far more devastating if there's an element of truth to it. So Paul certainly isn't saying just tell everybody what you really think about them. Thankfully, elsewhere, he tells us how to tell each other the truth. He says, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into him who is the head, even Christ. Would you read that? Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into him who is the head, even Christ. Ephesians 4.15. Speaking the truth in love. Three elements, you see it? I've got to speak, but I don't just speak truth. I speak truth, but I speak truth, why? In love. Perfect statement. It ought to, it's just a hallmark. This thing ought to be foundational in our thinking, in our relationships, our marriages, our families, every place where we can have anyone who wants to walk in integrity. That's the way you do it. There must be honesty between us for love to exist. But love must guide that honesty if it is to heal rather than tear. Love teaches us to speak without accusing. Without generalizing. You always, you never. Without imputing motives. I know why you did that and said that. Without selfishly dumping. I'm telling you this only to relieve myself of the anger and shame. Blah. Love teaches us to speak truth with the sole purpose of healing. Not punishing. We're honest because we are determined to love that person. Our intent is to remove every obstacle. And let the heart be free. If I'm absolutely committed to love you then I will enter into a process of speaking the truth in love with you. Not to show you that you're wrong, not to win an argument, not to relieve myself, but because I want us to love each other as our Lord has asked us to. I'm determined to love you. And so I will do the process that's necessary because it's not an easy process. Simple, but not easy. Honest conversations. Honest conversation is a deeply Christian activity. It's a process, a skill that's essential to reconciliation and therefore to staying in love for a long time. Here are some key guidelines. Number one, the reason I'll speak the truth is not to hurt you or expose your sin, but so that I can be restored to relationship with you. My goal is, is to love you from a pure heart. As, I, as, as we walk our Christianity, reconciliational meetings will be part of your life. Not once when you were 30. It'll be somewhat regular. It just seems like we do offend each other. You know, you can offend somebody just kind of by being you. And, and, and what happens, I actually believe the enemy comes in. And the enemy twists in other people's minds. You know, you will have, maybe you were not feeling well that day and you didn't greet them very well. And, you know, you were, you were actually headed to the restroom because you were ill. And they took it as, oh, they don't love me. They don't like me. Just, they just ignored me. Did you see that? And I really think, I mean, I'm not, just, I'm not just blaming the devil for everything. I'll say that in a second. But I really think there's something, there's a little spirit that wants to go, see that? Look what they did. I go through it almost every weekend because very seldom um, 
do I go through a weekend and people didn't walk out on me? Now, I know some of them are going to get their kids, but others, when it's a whole row, I don't think so. <laughs> and I'm, I'm serious. There isn't a weekend. And I, aren't I nice? I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what it is about me, but I'll have whole weekends where they're, and out they go, you know. Somebody leading the way, and I think, what, what? and I'm running through, what did I just say? What was it, you know? Um, and and you, go, you begin to run through the, the tapes, you know? You begin to think in your mind, what did I say? What did I do? What did I, what did I? And then, then, if you're not careful, you'll come up with, ah, I know why they're angry. And you'll supply a reason. Now, the fact was, they were ill and headed to the bathroom. But, but, not, but, but you took it personally, and then you began to figure out what it was that they were angry at about. And that made you angry. How dare they think that? And all of a sudden, there's an issue that has come between us. And there is not a trace of a real reason. And this happens, folks, all the time, doesn't it? I mean, this isn't just for some, a few. This is, this is all of us. I think it's, I think it's human. It certainly is in my life. It's in yours too, I think. So I begin to read things into why they said it. Read things into the way they acted. Read things into what it was. And the truth was something entirely else. There is an enemy. So if I'm going to love you, and if I'm going to keep my heart clean, when a shadow comes over my heart, When there's something inside that wants to pull back, a thought has entered. You can say, oh, pfft, not going to worry about it. That, 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 doesn't, that game, well, you might be able to just shake it off. But if it lingers and if the next time you see them, you aren't very friendly either. <laughs> if things stuck, the arrow's in. And now... Are you going to have the reconciliational event? Are you going to talk? Are you going to pretend and keep smiling? Hi there, you dog. <laughs> or are you going to walk in the light, speak the truth in love and say, I don't know whether there's an issue or not, but I feel hurt. I'm sorry, I'm not accusing you. I'm just telling you how I feel so that you and I can be re resolved. Were you upset with me the other day? No, I was nauseated. Okay, thank you. That's all I needed to know. Secondly, I will readily acknowledge my own sinful part in this matter. I never assume I am sinless in any exchange. Would you read that last line? I never assume I am sinless in any exchange. How about you? I really do. I figure even when, 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 when you're pretty much the fault, even the, how I react, there'll be sin in me somewhere. I think that's true of all of us. I think that's th the thing. So I don't ever think there's, uh, there's somebody who's in the right and somebody who's all in the wrong. I think there can sure be weighted. I understand that. But my job is to look for my part. My job is to look at my part, even the way I reacted to it. I will readily acknowledge my own sinful part in this matter. I never assume I am sinless in any exchange. Thirdly, I enter this uncomfortable conversation, and they are uncomfortable, because the Lord wants us to love each other. This is worshipful obedience. Nobody does this kind of thing because it's fun. And I must say, as the years go by, it doesn't get easier. Those kinds of honest conversations, those painful conversations, are never easy. Why do I do them then? My Lord asked me to. And he wants us to love each other. Go figure. So I will. I'll do my best. Paul will later on say, by the way, insofar as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Sometimes I can't make the other person participate. 
But insofar as it depends on me, I, I can do my part. Third, fourthly, I discern demonic confusion where it exists, but I don't just blame the devil. Now, you'll get into it with religious people. We, and the more religious, the more likely, you, you can get this thing where they go, oh, it's all the devil. The devil did this, and the devil did that, and the devil did the other thing. And that's, that's fine if it was the devil. But everything isn't the devil. You have flesh. And so to simply scapegoat it off to the devil and to not own your own flesh and to not be honest about your own attitudes, your own motives, your own feelings and the thing doesn't help anything. So I pointed out earlier, do I think there's a demonic part in this? Absolutely. Very often I do. A devil who's trying to separate us. I get it. But I discern what's him and then I also have to separate out what's me. My goal is not to prove you wrong and prove that you were in the wrong. I've had um, probably the last couple of months, almost every week or other week, I've had to have one or sometimes more of these kinds of meetings. They aren't all with me in my defense. Uh, but they're with staff or between people in the congregation, which hasn't resolved and so I pull people into my office, and I say, let's talk. And it's this. It's not a trial. I don't have a little gavel that goes, you know, <laughs> guilty. <laughs> and you'd be amazed at what happens when I try to get people to sit in there. I'll have people come in with, with documents, you know, and, and, and <laughs> so, you, know, you know, signed things and stuff like that, like, like and I'm thinking, I'm, we're not here to win. We're not here to prove that what a jerk that person is, okay? That you are, you are innocent as driven snow and that person's just a jerk. That's not what this meeting's about. It's not a trial. We're not having winners and losers. Except we're trying to have Jesus win. Because he says we got to love each other. And if we don't love each other, the body of Christ can't go forward and the anointing lives. So let's love each other. Let's talk and let's get out what we need to get out. Let's resolve. Now listen to me. I have had, I mean, I've, this has gone on for years, of course. It always will. But I've had even, even my own staff totally misunderstand this process. This is a long time ago, so you don't know who I'm talking about. You don't, I don't think. I hope. But I had one of these things where sometimes, you know, there'll be offenses with the staff and with the congregation. And there's an assumption in some of the staff at times, they're not at the, where because they're on staff, I should take their side. You know, automatically the congregation's wrong, and because they're paid, they're right. Well, it doesn't make sense to me. I'm the senior pastor of the church, so my job is to pastor and care for my flock, not divide them up, you know. Right's right, wrong's wrong. And you need to know it's the way I treat myself. It's the way I raise my family. I mean, I don't know what you call it, but it's, we're not going to take sides. But I had one situation and it just was, it was so telling to me. And I say it because some of you may be kind of skeptical of what I'm saying at the moment. And I had a congregational member come in and they'd been wounded by somebody on our staff. And they, the congregational member was really sweet. They came in and they were, they were this, they were vulnerable. They just, they just, it was not accusing. They just, they put their little heart on the table and said, this is what I feel. And, and the staff just began to deny. Oh, I never I never did that. I, I don't know how you came to that conclusion. And, and I'm sitting there going, well, well, I mean, did you probably maybe just a little bit you thought? No. And, and I got this stonewalling going over here, and I got this sweethearted congregation I remember over here going, you know. But what was interesting to me it's after that meeting, and we didn't win at all. We didn't, uh, it was 
the, the staff went out of that room feeling abused. Feeling that they had been subjected to some sort of abuse. To be asked to, to you know, to put your stuff on the table. And, and, and share like this. And, and admit you're wrong. And they hated my guts for it. And would not look me in the eye from that day forward until they were fired. Long ago, you don't know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I've been here so long, I can't use other... I mean, I've forgotten the other churches. No, I mean... <laughs> sorry to use you. Um... But I said to the person, I said, you weren't abused? I said, you just went through a profoundly Christian experience. You were reconciling. That, that's what Christians do. But that person was so threatened. They were furious. How dare you subject them to that? So I don't, I'm just trying to communicate to you, if you have that kind of thinking, stop it. Isn't that straightforward preaching right there? <laughs> yeah. Don't egg me on. Um, this, this process, this reconciliational thing where you and I humbly come together not to win an argument, not to accuse the other person, not to prove that they're wrong and I'm right, to own my own stuff in the thing, but my goal in it all of even speaking the truth, the only reason I do it is in love. So that you and I will love each other when we go out of here. That's winning. That's winning. When we go out of here and that, that cloud's gone off my heart. When you and I can smile at each other again and mean it. We just beat the devil. We just beat the devil. And we just pleased our master. And we just opened the door for the, for the body of Christ to work together in harmony. My goal is not to prove you were wrong. It isn't a trial. It's an act of healing. By honestly exposing my heart, I'm making myself vulnerable. But I know that honesty is the only path to tr restoring trust. I recognize our reconciliation to be an act of spiritual warfare. The devil desperately wants to divide us. To lift the anointing. To isolate people, to bring upon us God's righteous judgment, to neutralize the effectiveness of individuals, families, and congregations. By the way, can you see how this skill carries right into marriage, right into parenting, right into your workplace? I mean, this is, this is as fundamental as gravity. This isn't just a Christian idea, idea. If we can do it, wherever we do it, it works. And, and cloud our witness to unbelievers. By restoring our relationship, we defeat his attack and redirect it to work together for good. We actually come out of this stronger in our trust for one another. We discover we can resolve our differences so we don't have to walk on eggshells and pretend anymore. Sometimes you come out of these dis disagreements and then you, to you really reconcile and you come out of it with a, a deeper Trust for each other. I know that if you really say something that hurts me, that you'll, you'll repent of it. And if I do you, you will, I'll repent. And that you really want to love me. And it, what it happens is you'll find the relationship is not only just sort of put back together lightly. It's actually stronger than it was before. Fragile people. I, I, I add this, but I, and I want to add just in the, hear it in the, in, the, in the heart I'm saying it. Surprisingly often, I encounter people who, though Christians, seem completely unable to admit when they're wrong. In any attempt to reconcile, all they seem willing to do is rehearse the offenses done to them. They are terribly uncomfortable in these kinds of dialogues. And function like they are in mortal combat rather than an act of healing. I, 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 watch, I, I watch people just, oh, just terrified 
And so I, re and I'm no, I don't know why all of this, I, I, but I just observe it. And they seem desperate to avoid any admission that they sinned in any way. Anything they said was misunderstood. Anything they did is denied. And as soon as possible, they return to blaming others. I don't pretend to understand exactly why this occurs, but it happens often enough, and even among long-time Christians, that something needs to be said. I'm not trying to be cruel right now. I'm trying to expose something so we can get past it. And when I deal with people like this, the image that comes to mind is a balloon. One, one little pinprick, and it pops. Their self-esteem is so fragile that the slightest flaw that's exposed, any mistake they've made at all, seems to collapse entirely their self-esteem. And they fall, collapse into total self-loathing. Apparently, they are not secure enough to admit to themselves their own failures. I mention this only because it's there. And those of us who try to reconcile will on occasion encounter it. And the process becomes quite confusing. You have to, you leave having had a one-way conversation, feeling frustrated and embarrassed. Frankly, that's the way that congregational member went out of that meeting uh, that I mentioned. And I've had numerous ones of these. In these cases, all I know to do is to love the person anyway and pray that God will reveal to them their own sin and that Jesus' blood lifts any condemnation. I think it comes down to this. Why would I be afraid to say, yes, I felt that. Yes, I meant that. I reacted badly and I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? Why is that hard? Why, if I admit that, do I find that devastating to the point that I will defend myself and fight and dodge and weave and maneuver for, as though I'm fighting for my life? And all I can assume is there has, have some, of, some of, of us have been so damaged in the way people have treated us that we are convinced to the core that if we show an error... That either that, either people or God himself will cast us away. If you know that to be part of you, I, that's something to just ask the Lord to show you the depth of his grace. People, it is okay that we're not perfect. It's okay that we have weaknesses and do foolish things. It's okay that when I'm tired, I get grumpy. I need to apologize for it. I need to try to mitigate it. But I'm me. You're you. And if we don't learn to live with each other at that genuine level, we won't live together at all. We play the religious game. We show up and we smile and we pretend to love. Because very few of us, if, if when we're angry, <laughs> we're so friendly the smile comes on the game comes on how you doing? doing great brother wouldn't tell you how I'm doing you'll not hear one thing about me and so the heart's guarded the heart's angry and the face is smiling the, the Old Testament calls it two-faced I'm one way to your face I'm another way behind your back and it It happens in, in Washington State enough. This is really something we need to give attention to. It's not like, boy, Arizona, do they need to hear this. You know, <laughs> this is a truth for those guys. Those, it's true in Washington. It's us, too, just as much as anybody. Conclusion. What dies when we pretend to love is trust. And when trust is gone, we can't work together. We don't say what we really feel, so we harbor growing resentment until we come to hate each other, fighting or even 
insignificant, or fighting over even insignificant matters. So Paul says, don't pretend to love. Because honesty, when spoken in love, in love, heals rather than divides even when it exposes areas of painful disagreement. If you and I are going to obey Paul's command that we not pretend to love, then we're going to have to learn to reconcile our differences, to expose our hearts to a frightening new degree. Over and over again, we're going to have to choose to love each other like Jesus has loved us. If we do, then his church will move forward in power, as called people, work together in harmony. We have to fight for this. I appreciate it when those of you when, come to me and say, Pastor, you offended me. I don't like to hear it. But I'm really grateful that you came and you told me to my face so that I have the opportunity to apologize or to get it straight or to say, oh yeah? No. Oh. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> so I have the opportunity to say, well, here's what I understood. And see, if, 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 I can, if you and I can just do that, not trying to win, but walk in the light, that's how we grow strong. And then you have a body where the gifts and the ministries and the callings of God are used all over the place. Now, I'm not hoping that I have a line here, <laughs> but I will say, if I have hurt you, if you are angry at me, I'd rather you told me to face much more than I'd rather have you walk out of the church and say, well, I don't want to be with a guy like that. I am what I am, and it may not be the right. I'm just speaking on behalf. We all feel this way. But I am what I am. And, and I can change just so much. I can do what I can. But I would far rather you and I walked in the light with each other. And we'll both grow from it. Than to have people just quietly walk out the back. And go somewhere else. I remember one family. I'll close with this. One fellow left. And then he left this for another church. And then he left that church for another church. And I think he was on his third. And, and he came and had lunch with me. And, and he said, you know, I, I don't know what to do. He said, I'm, you know, one went here and then that didn't work. And he went here. And I said, I can tell you what the answer is. Do you want to know? And he says, yeah. I said, I'll tell you. I, got, I really think this is a word from the Lord. You say you're frustrated and you don't know what to do. Can I tell you what to do? Either come back to, to Northwest or go to this other church and just get back in and walk through all the problems and all the relationships and walk in the light with people. And I said, in the midst of that mess, God will teach you. He didn't. He went on to another. But, but that's the problem. And that's what America is doing right now. They're just tossing people away like that. Just get out of my life. Get out of my life. I'll find another bunch. I'll divorce you. I'll throw you out of my life. I'll defriend you. We have to stop disposing of one another. And we have to start loving each other. And love isn't when you find the right person. It isn't when you find the perfect group. It's when you decide to love. It's when you decide to love. And by George, you know what? You will love. And you'll find some of the people that made you the angriest become lifelong friends. Lifelong friends that you trust because you've been through the fire with them. And you know what they're like in the middle of a reconcile. Would you stand with me? Church, this is a decision that we can make. 
I, I think that you would say that, that our own congregation is, is very much at the point of, of Romans 12.8. Th there are people discovering their gifts and their callings. There's people who are surrendered to the Lord, people who are just moving on. And it, for God to do what he really wants to do in our midst, we need to go to Romans 12, 9 as well. And not like it doesn't happen. Believe me, I'm not saying that. But the deeper we'll go, and the more this becomes universal, a part of our life, we get it. This will release things. I think it releases the power of the Holy Spirit. It'll affect your marriage. It'll affect your family. It'll affect your skills at work. The way you get along. It affects everything. This is not negotiable. It's not for some people. This is a truth that if you learn it and I learn it, life begins to heal. And our Father, we, we bow before you and your, your Son commanded us. He said, love one another even as I have loved you. He told us to love like this. Master, we choose to obey. We choose to speak the truth in love, to not pretend to love, to not be actors, but to let our heart show, but to do it kindly and carefully and with a deep purpose of reconciliation so that you can pour out your spirit at another level, so that men and women can move forward in the gifts and callings of God, so that the lost can be found, so that the broken can be healed, so that children can be discipled and young and old, so that the mighty move of God in our day, in this place, can take place. Oh, Lord God, don't let one of us escape. Capture us. Capture us until we love without hypocrisy. I, I'll stand first in line for this, Jesus. Grace us and be with us. Church, if that is your prayer, if you say, I, I, I get it, I understand what this means, would you say, yes, Master. We hear you. We will love without hypocrisy. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.